Um, I'm going to be talking today. I'm calling this is the first public demonstration of progressive teaching in, uh, initiative. And uh, the reason for that is that we first developed this as a science program. Uh, and it's moved from science to math. And in so doing, we've looked for what are the common principles that we've learned from our science program that allow us to really inform how teaching can be improved and how students can be better engaged in learning. Uh, these are the results we got. I'm going to give you some results first so that you have some reason to think it's worth listening to the rest. Then I'll tell you how we got the results. Uh, this axis is multiple of New Jersey. So this bar right here at one, this would be what an average New Jersey school does. This is what we achieved in our school, AP exams by department. And you see that science is the green bar. We went to three times better than the state, to four times, up to five and a half times. Five and a half times as many students in our school were taking science AP exams. Uh, you'll notice, that this was very important because I did my doctoral dissertation on this program and its results, and they asked me, well, how do we know it's not just that you picked all brilliant students or something? You know, there's a lot of other explanations. But you'll notice that every other subject through all these years is below the state average. The only subject that went above the state average was in science. So here are the PSI methods. We do everything differently. And so I, I apologize that this is complex, but it's no more complex than it needs to be if you want to revolutionize education. We changed the curriculum, the pedagogy, assessment strategies, technology. We created professional learning communities, and we changed the pacing. Uh, the first key thing is you need a measurable goal. We use the AP exams on our PSI. It's very important you have something to work towards, some goal that the students believe in, and the parents believe in, and the teachers believe in. They all have to think that what they're doing is going somewhere. It can't just be another pointless class that they take. They learn stuff, and at the end of the year, never use it again. They have to believe it's going forward and will be important to them. It's going to get them into a better college. It's going to get them scholarships. It's going to make them more likely to graduate from college. Then once you know you've got your goal, then you can, do, you can align all your curriculum. You align the science courses, so physics teaches what you need to understand chemistry, teaches what you need to know bi to biology. This becomes a three-year story. Someone the other day talked about the importance of stories. Stories are critical. People need to have a story that begins with the beginning of physics and moves right through to biology. In the United States, we don't typically do it this way, and I'll show you how we do it in a second. Horizontal alignment, that is when you're learning math, just in time says, learn the math you need to solve the science problems you're facing. Kids all the time in the United States are saying, what am I ever going to use this math for? No one in our school ever says that, because they're constantly learning math and then using it in their science class. They learn how to solve linear equations, then they go outside and shoot a rocket up in the air, and the teacher says, Based on what you know, tell me how, how fast did it leave the ground, how high did it go? And they just work in groups and figure it out. They can do that because they learn the math. The kids who don't know the math feel like they are at a disadvantage, so they go learn the math from each other. And we don't do dead ends. That is, uh, if it's not going to be on the AP exam, it's not going to be used in any AP exam, and we don't think it's useful for them to learn, we just cut it out of the curriculum because we don't want to have them feel like we wasted their time. This is a typical structure in the United States. I reversed the order of these slides, because in the United States, everyone knows this. But in the United States, we teach biology, then chemistry. But biology doesn't prepare you for chemistry. And biology has nothing to do with algebra. So these subjects, they go from class to class. They have no connection to each other. Even if they take um, more subjects, they still have no connection to each other. It's a pointless. Each course is a sort of a dead end. And these courses, the math is barely connected to the science. What we do is this, we do physics, chemistry, biology, physics, and there's great papers on this, and all of this, everything I'm saying, by the way, is backed up in much greater depth uh, on our website that I'll show you. Uh, physics prepares you for chemistry, and physics and chemistry together prepare you for modern biology. You, if you go in the reverse order, there's no story to tell, it makes no sense, it's memorizing. If you go in this order, it's a beautiful story, it makes perfect sense, the students love it. The pedagogy, uh, very similar to what you've been hearing so far. We started doing this about 10 years ago. We use round tables. The students don't sit in rows. They sit around round tables so they can work in groups. Kids like talking to each other. We'd like them to talk, do physics, so have them talk together about physics. It works out very nicely. It's their favorite class to go to. 
used to be in every other school in the United States, it's the hardest, most difficult, boring class to go to. In our school, it's the nicest class to go to. Teacher is part of the social group. It's often missed. They think of social constructivism, meaning you lock 20 kids in a room, come back in a year, and hope they learned physics. It doesn't work that way. It took 2,000 years for humankind to develop physics. They have to be taught physics. So you need direct instruction. So what happens is, and you'll see how this works, is they teach using smart notebooks for five or 10 minutes. And then they go to the next slides as they go through the notebook are questions that the students have smart responders. They put in the answers and you get a pie chart and you don't tell the, ki you don't tell the kids what's right and what's wrong. All you do is you look at the answers. If, some, if half of them have four and half of them have 16, then one of them's either squaring when they shouldn't or the other one's square rooting when they shouldn't. As a teacher, you diagnose those where you can ask someone who believes it's 16, stand up and explain to someone who thinks it's four. And then they talk to each other, they argue, and then they have it, then they revote. Very quickly, you can drive with this direct instruction intermingled with social constructivism. The kids love it. They're all moving at the fastest pace they can move, the zone of proximal development. They're never bored. We get the kids the way they walk through the door. Our problem is once they walk through the door, formative assessment is going to make it more likely they're going to be successful. Uh, we let kids, we do a lot of frequent quizzes. This is something I have a lot of trouble, you know, a lot of teachers object to at first. But if you get, once they get used to it, they love it. Uh, when you look at our website, not only do we have all the smart notebook presentations, but we also have all the tests, all the quizzes, but we make multiple versions of everything. Because anytime a kid isn't happy with his grade, we just tell him to take another test. Go home, study, work with your friends, look over the old test, we have another version, take it. We always count the highest grade. So we're not, we're not setting kids up for failure, we're setting them up for success. We've never had a kid fail our physics course. 0% failure. If, if the parents come in, you know, upset that how is so-and-so doing and, you know, how come they got a bad grade, you say, well, let them take it again. As a matter of fact, I'll stay after school with them or so-and-so will, and we'll teach it to them again and they can retake it. Very important. That makes, by the way, everything we test, every test we give is formative because every one can be retaken. Uh, uh, ungraded, so this is the assessment, is ungraded, embedded, formative assessment that's in the smart notebooks. We grade all of those. This is another controversial thing relative to the US. We give no points for showing up, participating, being nice, giving presents to teachers or anything else. The only points you can earn in the class are by getting questions right on tests. We don't really care how you did it. If you, can, if you need to do homework to do it, do homework. If you don't need to do homework, don't. We don't care, it's not our problem. Our problem is when you sit down with a blank piece of paper in front of you and a question, can you answer it? Can you solve the problem? If you can't solve the problem, how do I know you didn't copy from somebody else, get answers from a friend on the bus to school that morning? Uh, and it wastes everyone's time trying to pester the kids. We tell the kids, you know, you failed the quiz. The quiz is very much like the homework. If you did the homework, you should have passed the quiz. Did you do the homework? Kids always say, no, I didn't do the homework. And you say, well, maybe you should think about doing the homework. Very quickly, they start doing the homework. Classroom technology. You want to make sure I get this part in here. Smart boards. We use up-to-date computer, projectors, smart board, responders, round tables. We find that this gives you a modern environment. Kids are used to multitasking, doing lots of stuff, moving very fast. Teachers turning their back to the kids to write on the board is a waste of their time and boring for the kids. This way you're clicking through slides, you're writing on slides. Smart responders give you real-time analysis. If the kids got the first set of questions right, just skip the next few questions, go to keep teaching. So we teach much faster. Smart lesson study, we can exchange lessons between teachers and every, every teacher then continually improves the lessons. Uh, all pe everything's posted on site. This is the part that you might find interesting from our discussions which is rather than emailing them back and forth, now that we have 100 teachers using the same methods, we take all the materials and post them. They're free for anyone to use. And any, any teacher can access all of them, including the tests. Any student can access everything except the tests. And we don't charge anything for it. The only thing we ask is, is as teachers improve things, as they use them and to come up with better ideas, they send them to us and we use theirs instead of ours. Uh, Intraschool, the weekly meetings, we think that teachers should be meeting, common teachers teaching the same courses should be meeting every week to refine what they're doing. And we believe in common school-wide assessments, same tests, same days, so all students in the school can study together regardless of their teacher. And they can go to any teacher in the school to help for help regardless of who their teacher is.
we keep a very high pace going because we think if, uh, you're, if, you're going, if you're not going at a high pace, you're going to bore students. If you go too fast, you're going to lose students. The retakes and all the things we do make it possible for everyone to be successful. And I think this is all part of the same thing. As you'll see, when you get to the end, when you get to the last of these, it's almost a restatement of what came before because all the six approaches all weave together. The pacing is really made possible by everything else we do. And this is very much a belief of ours, which is if what's good for students is good for teachers, what's good for teachers is good for students. Very often in the United States now they're talking about accountability, like teachers somehow don't want their kids to succeed. All teachers want their kids to succeed. If you give the teachers a program that has the potential to be successful, they'll work very, very hard and the students will succeed and the teachers will be happy.